So hello and welcome to this sixth session of the UCL SDG conference Beyond Boundaries. Um, in this session, we're going to focus on transforming infrastructures with a specific focus on energy. So my name is Barbara Lipietz. I'm Associate Professor at the Bartlett Development Planning Unit, where I lead the MSc in Urban Development Planning. In UCL, I'm also uh, a steering committee on the Urban Lab and co-chair of UCL's Grand Challenge for Sustainable Cities. My interests are in the governance of urban transformations with a particular interest in co-production processes, which includes, of course, uh, an attentiveness to the role of university as public actor. So I'm particularly interested to hear what my panelists are going to be saying about that and how they're going to be challenge, challenging um, us as academics in the university. With me co-chairing today and uh, supporting also this session is my colleague, Professor Sarah Bell, uh, Sarah is Professor of Environmental Engineering in the Institute for Environmental Design at UCL. Her research focuses on the sustainability of urban water systems, with particular emphasis on community engagement with infrastructure. She is an EPSRC Living with Environmental Change Research Fellow, a Chartered Engineer and a Fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Chartered Institution of Water and Environmental Management. So this session on infrastructure is really a reflection of the centrality of infrastructure in delivering the SDGs. Infrastructure has its own goal, SDG number nine, but there are other infrastructure goals which are more or less obvious um, in the following SDGs. So energy, uh, which is SDG seven, water, SDG six, sustainable cities, SDG 11, economic growth, SDG eight, and productive, Production and Consumption, SDG 12. Crucially, infrastructure are what links goals related to human well-being, health and prosperity to the natural environment that we depend upon. So infrastructure enable the delivery and distribution of resources, but also return waste and pollution back to the environment. So it is infrastructure that takes water from our rivers through treatment works and pipe networks to our bathrooms and then back again through our sewage system to be treated hopefully and discharged back to the environment. And it's of course um, infrastructure that takes wind, en wind energy from the winds um, and, and hopefully powering the computers that we now all rely on in this Zoom Zoomified world. Um, without addressing infrastructure goals therefore we have very little hope of achieving any of the other sustainable development goals. But infrastructure is tricky. Some infrastructures are owned by governments, others by the private sector, whilst vast numbers of women and men globally are having to develop their own infrastructures or hack existing infrastructure networks, networks in the face of in existence or highly skewed infrastructure networks. Many people in the world still live without basic infrastructure services. And as a result, they have to pay disproportionately high prices to access basic services like energy and water. Delivering sustainable infrastructure is a huge te technical challenge. It's a, a huge financial challenge and arguably it's an even greater governance challenge. So who pays for infrastructure? How do we develop and regulate infrastructure to ensure just access in the parlance of the, ADG, of the SDGs to leave no one behind? Um, how do we do that whilst ensuring other SDG goals of resource efficiency and carbon zero emissions? And then also how can local, local communities deliver their own infrastructure or influence the future systems they want to see? Energy infrastructure is of particular importance in delivering development out outcomes while responding to the climate emergency. And as we'll hear from our panel, energy underpins many of the SDGs. So transitioning to just zero carbon energy systems is perhaps one of the greatest challenges for this entire agenda. So to help us think through these enormous challenges, we have a, a wonderful and diverse set of speakers, um, which are purposefully from a variety of, um, of fields and different actors of society. So we have speakers from academia and research, government and trend unions who are working at a variety of scales also from the very local, uh, for instance, Camden, uh, which is where UCL is situated to national and global scales. 
So we are going to, the structure of this session is uh, the following. I'm going to introduce each of the speakers who will have a, a, a chance to, to elaborate on some of the key issues they'd like to bring to the conversation. Um, and then we will have um, two parts of the session. One where we will have time to have a conversation about the, what the various incarnations of just energy transitions. Um, and then the latter part of the conversation will focus more specifically on the role of the university in supporting these just transitions. And I've asked um, our speakers to be as provocative uh, as, the, as they wanted to. We in the university need indeed to be provoked to become uh, even stronger uh, co-producers of knowledge in order to support these just transitions. So, I'm going to start now with uh, my colleague Priti Patel. Uh, Priti Parikh, sorry, my apologies. Priti is a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers and she is an associate professor at UCL. She has 15 years of engineering industry experience in Asia, Africa, and UK on infrastructure delivery. And she has the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary EFID Research Center that addresses the SDGs through infrastructure. Puri has been recognized as an Engineers Without Borders change maker, and she serves as chair of the editorial panel for Institution of Civil Engineers, Engineering Sustainability Journal. So Priti, I'm gonna ask you to talk about a research that you have done with UCL colleagues, which is a huge large scale study exploring the synergies and trade-offs between energy and the other SDGs. Could you tell us a little bit more about your findings, please? Sure, thank you, Barbara. And good morning, afternoon, every evening to everyone who's joining us today. So I'm Dr. Preeti Parikh, I'm the Head of Engineering for International Development Research Center at GCM, where we specifically look at infrastructure access in resource challenge settings, such as remote rural communities and informal settlements. And I'm also part of the UCL Energy and Development Group, which is a collective of interdisciplinary academics from different departments and faculties. And as a group, we worked together to review evidence on linkages between energy systems and SDGs using a structured process that we developed in-house at UCL. And through this process, what we identified was that with energy systems, there are synergies between energy and all 17 of the SDG goals and 143 out of the 169 SDG targets. Now, what does this mean? This means that we cannot achieve SDGs without targeted action in energy systems. So basically, if a nation wants to achieve their SDG targets, they have to invest in energy. Our review also demonstrated that there are wide ranging benefits of improving access to energy, which was not just about infrastructure, but was also about ending poverty, about improving access to healthcare, education systems, and improving access to all other forms of infrastructure, such as water and systems, which need energy access. Energy access also has a vital role in addressing climate change and in moving forward with sustainable cities. But as we move forward to a just future, we need to make sure that we address trade-offs. And we found that there were trade-offs in uh, between energy systems and addressing SDGs. For example, when we think about large infrastructure projects, um, there could be negative impacts on local communities and populations. Or if we think about uh, communities that still use charcoal and wood, uh, there are negative impacts, whether they are health or environmental impacts. We also applied the structure process and a methodology for solar energy systems in Rwanda. And interestingly enough, we found that even in Rwanda, for the solar energy sector, action in solar energy addressed 50% of the SDG targets. And this really makes a strong case for investment in renewables, both for human development and for achieving a low carbon future. This is where I'm going to stop. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Priti. Um, lots to talk about here from, from this very short introduction. I'm going to now uh, turn to Sam Mason, Sam who doesn't need uh, reminding about the relevance and the broad reaching importance of energy. Um, Sam is National Policy Officer at the Public and Commercial Services Union, 
um, PCS Trade Union with a focus on the impacts of climate change and the environment on workers. She is lead author on the PCS pamphlet called Energy Democracy and Just Transition, a civil service perspective. And she's co-author of the PCS pamphlet entitled Aviation Democracy. She's a member of the New Lucas Plan Project and leads the Just Transition Working Group on Human-Centered Technology for Socially and Ecologically Useful Production. Sam, over to you. Thanks, Barbara, and um, many thanks for the invitation to participate in this session and really looking forward to it. Um, I was just gonna make a couple of short um, contributions about some key points I want to get across and largely around sort of energy choices towards decarbonisation and trade unions within a justice pathway and really why we talk about this as a justice pathway why, rather than just an energy transition to deal with obviously the, the wider climate goals that we need to meet. Now obviously within the three dimensions of sustainable development, economic and social environmental, um, we link these within a climate justice framing but also include political justice which takes account um, not just the current generations, but future generations, but we put political justice in there as well, because that's about people's equality in terms of political participation within these broad based discussions. Um, at trade union level, a broad level in, in the UK, but also internationally, this is reflected with a trade union consensus around public ownership and democratic control of the energy system and a drive to uh, of that towards ending fuel poverty on the global perspective we'd obviously include energy poverty in that as well um, but what we don't agree on is the decarbonization pathways and what they should look like including the, the targets for those sort of 2030 versus 2050. But one of the things we say in my union as well is that we need to look um, at energy as a system and as part of a whole economy approach. So not just about sort of the energy transition if you're talking about from fossil fuels to renewable energy, which we tend to get locked into those debates a lot of the time, but also how we use energy, what it's used for, who needs energy, who owns energy, et cetera. So wider issues around that. And I think um, one of the problems why we get stuck in that approach is because we're trying to bolt decarbonisation onto the current system rather than rethinking the, the whole system. And that's linked into the profit market base driven process that we're in. And I thought it was interesting, one of the previous sessions, um, a speaker referenced to the SDGs are based on an unfounded optimism that the current economic model can help. And I think that's very much sort of rooted in our, in our thinking around some of those, but linked to that in terms of the worker transition within these systems, we see that beyond just what we call a sort of green capitalism of a just transition approach, but around power and power relations within that, but also a transformational process that looks at wider and addresses wider issues of the inherent inequalities of our system. So addressing issues of race, disability, gender, justice, et cetera. So I will leave it there for now, thanks. Thanks, uh, Sam. And very interesting, again, we'll, we'll come back to that, to your particular uh, phrasing and understanding of what a just transition might mean in the case of energy from a worker's perspective, which is often uh, probably forgotten in many of the debates. Now we're going to turn to uh, Adam uh, Harrison. Uh, Adam Harrison, who is a cabinet member for a sustainable Camden in the borough of Camden. Um, he leads there the council's environmental work, including carbon reduction, air quality, transport, biodiversity, and green space. And uh, Adam is, we've been asked Adam to talk to us about an experiment that Camden Council has been involved in and in which uh, Adam was very central. Uh, and this was in 2019, Camden Council conduct conducted the first um, I think it is the first, you'll correct me, Adam, the first UK's uh, Citizens' Assembly on the Climate Emergency and incorporating all of the citizens' recommendation in its newly adopted Climate Action Plan. So um, if you could talk to us a little bit about that. Um, thanks very much and thank you very much for the invitation and it is always great to work with UCL as we heard earlier. Um, UCL is based within Camden and uh, we need to keep on strengthening uh, those relations. Uh, I'm also councillor for Bloomsbury where UCL is based and uh, represented thousands of students over the years. So, so thank you. Um, yeah, 2019, we uh, 
uh, we conducted the citizens assembly made up of 50 citizens who live in Camden who came together over three sessions to learn about uh, deliberate uh, on the climate emergency and then put forward a number of recommendations. Uh, 17 of them uh, were, were put forward, which we then later incorporated into declaring a climate emergency. Uh, and then eventually this year, uh, we adopted uh, a carbon action plan, uh, which, um, uh, which, we're, which we've now tasked ourselves with taking forward. And the citizens, uh, we didn't know what they were going to um, recommend at the end. Um, they, uh, they, they, were, they were certainly extremely committed. The uh, issue was uh, extremely salient. Uh, we, unlike you know other forms of um, deliberative or part participatory processes, you can you can get dropouts and so on. But it would, they were highly committed, and and they did actually identify quite a number of uh, energy related uh, uh, recommendations for us, which um, as I say we weren't necessarily ex expecting. Um, we uh, my, my, perhaps my worry had been going into it that energy sometimes gets overlooked as something that's sort of in the background and, and people just sort of sort of get used to. But uh, to give you an idea of some of the things that uh, they asked us to, to work on, which we'll be doing now over the next few years, is to you know build out our uh, electric transport infrastructure, uh, to make uh, developers, so the people building new buildings in the borough, fund energy retrofit. They asked for all new homes in carbon in Camden to be zero carbon. They asked for the council buildings to be fossil fuel free by 2030. So quite a challenging uh, set of recommendations, uh, which we've now uh, reorganised ourselves internally in, in order to try to meet those, which I can talk about uh, a bit later if, if that's of interest. And um, I'll just add as, as well, perhaps that um, the, um, uh, the the participatory approach is something we've really been trying to. Uh, uh, and promote an experiment with in Camden over the last few years. And we've done it on, on a number of di different topics. It's had um, endorsement from, from kind of the highest levels within the council in terms of uh, the lead of the council, but also at the time, the MP Keir Starmer, who's now the leader of the British Labour Party, endor endorsed the assembly. So uh, it's a very exciting process uh, and uh, happy to talk more about it later. Thanks very much, Adam. And it's really interesting to hear about this experiment, um, which is now starting to develop in different parts of the UK and, and elsewhere. Very interesting to hear about this participatory uh, process and the way in which then it gets carried into policy. Um, as we know, often in the energy sector in particular, there are some very strong lobbies <laughs> that sort of cloud the way in which um, decision making is done. And first, somebody who can tell us uh, quite a lot about that coming from a financial uh, perspective in particular is our next panelist, um, Sarah Colin Brenda. Sarah is the Director of Climate and Sustainability Program at the Overseas Development Institute. Sarah is an environmental economist who works broadly across urban, climate and fiscal policy. She has worked with policymakers in Asia, Africa and Latin America to design and implement low carbon development strategies. Sarah has published extensively in academic journals as well as reports for the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, UN Environment and the World Bank. She is a guest lecturer at UCL, Oxford and Manchester. Sarah. Thank you very much for that generous introduction, Barbara, and for the opportunity to be here today. So thanks to UCL. Uh, I, I really enjoyed hearing from the other panelists about the nature of their work they're doing, uh, because it ties into some of the bigger challenges I wanted to raise today. I, I think Martin Luther King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I think many of us looking at the news at the moment might not feel that that is the case. And infrastructure and the provision of infrastructure in an equitable and sustainable way is inextricably tied into all of the wider processes and patterns of decision making and where power sits. So for example, as, as wealth is consolidated among a smaller and smaller number of people, so the design of infrastructure and specifically the finance available for that infrastructure becomes subject to what they are willing to provide and who they are willing to serve and the returns that they expect and the risks that they are willing to take. And so when we hear, for example, from Sam very rightly about the importance of, of a just transition that takes into account workers' perspectives, we also need to ask about wider society-wide patterns whereby the balance between workers and the people providing finance for the projects that they will be building and subsequently operating and, and the balance of power between them determines our scope for a just transition. 
And this plays out really strongly in sectors like energy, where we start to see that uh, the financial and the economic case for something like clean energy is now very compelling, not only in direct commercial terms, but all the wider benefits that Priti was speaking about earlier, health, accessibility, economic development. But those things ultimately are rendered irrelevant if commercial banks and other investors are not willing to invest in these projects. So I guess my, channel for the, my challenge for the panel today is to really critically engage with who are the winners and losers of different infrastructure options and to critically think through the, the broad conditions that they're facing that shape their decisions, including things like the coalitions that need to be built to lay the foundations for a more just alternative, bringing together all of the constituencies that the other speakers have already spoken about, the neighbourhoods of Camden, the workers involved in the project, the engineers and architects and so on who are involved in delivering that architecture. It's, it's not a small challenge, but I think it's a, an exciting and urgent one. Thank you very much, Sarah. And indeed, you, you lay a lot of the foundation for the conversation that's going to come up. Um, we're going to be now collecting the conversation from the audience. But as we do that, I would like to uh, get our panelists to give uh, their impression or their thought about what a just en energy transition looks like from their perspective. As that, and as we can see, we've got quite a lot of different perspective around the table. And as Sarah has mentioned, we probably need to get these different perspectives to start talking to each other in a much more um, engaged and frank manner. So Sam, can I ask you to start from your perspective, uh, developing a little bit more this idea of what a just energy transition might mean from the trade union perspective? Thanks. Thanks, Barbara. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think in a way, Sarah kind of touched on this to some degree in the sense of the rebalancing of power. Um, you know, we have in trade union terms an enormous shift of power away from workers, um, particularly in the UK, that's around particular political motives. So therefore, um, that sort of denies the, the, the ability of workers to actually participate in a process in terms of the conversation around just transition and the energy transition in particular. But I think one thing for us in PCS, because you know we're, we're a civil service trade union, so you know we, we sit ourselves within the public sector, and so a lot of people have asked us, including our comrades in other trade unions, you know, why is this an issue for you? You don't have members in the energy sector, but we've always been really clear. I mean, one, obviously, our members sit in roles monitoring, regulating, um, and dealing with policy, nationwide policy, national policy on energy, but also we think energy is part of everybody's lives and it's the glue that binds us all together. We're sitting here today because of energy. Um, so I think we've all actually got a stake in this conversation as well. So part of that justice element in, and it's why we have this more broader framework around a just transition. It's not just about workers in the energy sector who are of course very important and have to be um, dealt with in a particular way and, and have those conversations. But I think it's a conversation for all of us because the energy choices impact on the ways in which we, we live and the ways in which we work, the way we, we travel about and how we operate within our communities. And it has impacts as well. So it's not just about the job, which of course are vitally important, but it also has to deal with um, <clears throat> how we sort of reshape and transform the whole of our economies and, and address these issues of inequality. So the, the basic frameworks for a just transition around reskills, retraining, social protections and consultation are all very important, but they need to go beyond that because we don't have um, getting a seat at the table under processes of social dialogue, for example, we don't have the same positions of power in those conversations and, and certainly you know there's very few people in those conversations so I think it's very important that we look at it in a much broader sense and actually go back to the origins which was much more political of the just transition narrative which um, resonates in the United States in the 70s and um, some people who be familiar with Tony Mazzarco who was actually in the chemical and um, oil workers union and atomic energy workers where this came out of occupational health and safety. So I, I, that's hopefully addressed some of the Thanks very much, Sam. And uh, one question, if you if you don't mind us answering is, or just giving us a hint as to how it can be resolved is that 
within the trade unions movement, there are likely to be different positions around what kind of energy transitions uh, are likely to have. How does one craft some form of a common perspective around that? Is it possible to create some form of current, uh, common perspective in order to facilitate your engagement with other actors, for instance? It's a difficult uh, question, I'm sure. I think the way in which we've kind of approached it so far is under what we call the energy democracy framework. So the public ownership and democratic control of energy because we've got more or less a common position across the major trade unions in the UK and we're part of a, a global network of trade unions for energy democracy. So I think that has very specific principles in it which we can have a consensus on and if we don't have a consensus about what that energy is that we're talking about um, democratic control over. Um, but I mean, some of the things that are embodied that are around these principles of ending fuel poverty um, and energy poverty in, in some countries as it um, is less so obviously in, in the UK, but um, so those things that we, we do agree on, we do agree on things like the need for mass retrofit and programs like this to deal with some of those issues. So that's where we've got common ground. But I think what becomes difficult is because obviously where trade unions had their current membership. So if we look at a trade union like the GMB, that's actually was born out of the gas industry. So it has a very strong emotional ties to that sector. So it's very hard to have those conversations. Um, with, with some of those unions. But I think also just around the, the, the emergency of the climate situation, the need for decarbonisation, um, you know, workers live in a reality. Um, and, and I think sometimes when we talk about particular trade unions or workers in, in sectors, we, we kind of dehumanise them that they're not actually concerned with all these big issues and they are having these conversations. And there was a very fantastic report some of you may have seen that was done by a few organisations, Platform, Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth in Scotland with the offshore oil and gas workers um, about just transition and would they transition into renewable energy jobs and, and unsurprisingly I think around 82% of the answers were but perhaps what was more surprisingly 91% of the respondents to their questionnaires hadn't heard of the term just transition and I think that kind of says a lot about our conversations and how we're bringing those down from the centre into the, the shop floor so to speak um, which is what we need to be doing. Okay, thanks very much, Sam. Adam, could you tell us what was uh, what came out from from the deliberations in the Climate Assembly? What were the citizens' visions? Um, the oh, that wasn't quite what I was going to say. Um, citizens, um, uh, I mean, they they covered quite a broad range of topics. So some of which I mentioned earlier. They also alighted on uh, particularly focused on community engagement. They were very keen for us. As a council to be leading uh, an information and education campaign. They wanted um, CO2 reduction to be made more fun. That was the, the term that they all uh, agreed on. And I, I think they, they make a powerful point there about, about engagement. Uh, and they, and they, uh, they identified a whole host of other areas uh, as well. One of which um, they didn't quite uh, alight on actually was uh, the importance of uh, business and commercial uh, premises in uh, in, in carbon emissions, which actually make up the majority in Camden, um, um, which will be true of lots of places, but Camden has, has about 2% of the UK's economy lo located within it. Um, so it was, um, the, whole, the whole exercise, exercise was, was powerful and it's, um, in, it helps inform and uh, kind of support some of the actions we are now taking at all levels uh, in the council, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, changes to how, how we uh, help people tra travel around the, the borough in terms of transport or whether it's um, you know, energy retrofit work that we, that we want to do. Um, but, but I think it's um, worth remembering that, um, that as, as I said, they, they didn't particularly make recommendations around business. Um, so the participatory approach is powerful. It doesn't always um, uh, alight on everything. And that's why you, you, know, you still have to make sure you, you take the broader view and fill, it, fill in uh, any gaps if there, if there are any. Okay. Thank you. I think Sarah, you want yeah. to jump in? Yeah. I'm just going to jump in with some of the questions that are coming up from the floor um, now, Barbara. And I think I'm going to direct this one to Preeti first, but uh, I'm sure our other panelists might want to uh, respond too. Uh, it's the big question of what do you think, or do you think that the sustainable development goals are enough? Do they go far enough when it comes to energy and climate change? So we have two separate goals in this agenda. Um, and then 
presumably, you know, <laughs> if you don't, what do you think are the key issues for, mm -hmm. for dealing with energy and climate change within an SDG framework? So pretty given that you um, were part of a very extensive project looking at all of the SDGs and uh, energy, perhaps you can give us your thoughts. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think that SDGs provide this unifying framework uh, which aligns with the complexity that faces us because we live in a world which has complex challenges, whether it's urbanization, population growth, climate change, conflict. And what I found interesting in our SDG work was that uh, it was not just a matter of energy systems being linked to 169 targets, but also the interlinkages between various SDGs. So what I felt was that whilst the SDG framework was not perfect, but it did provide this unifying framework brought us together, which brought together interdisciplinary expertise, which brought together uh, players from various sectors, whether they were public, private, uh, sectors. So I think I'm happy to Sarah, given the, the extensive work we've done on SDGs to say, I think, and I, I'm an optimist, where I believe that SDGs can be used as a framework to address energy and climate change issues. Uh, great, thanks. I'm, I'm not seeing any of my other panellists or our other panellists wanting to jump in there. So I'm now going to go to the next question, which uh, I think is very much um, aligned to Sarah's uh, expertise. Um, and that, Sarah, is what's the role of alternative financing models uh, in supporting these um, transitions? And in particular, if we think that decentralised energy systems or decentralised infrastructure systems are part of this transition, where do, you know, are there any, you know, great new alternative models or, or perhaps even some old financing models that, you um, we've forgotten about or left behind that, you know, can help to deliver this transition. Thanks very much, Sarah. And thanks to Honora for your question. It's a great one. And I think I've come across your work uh, in separate topics on, in this space. I think you're at Sheffield, right? Um, I guess the question is the scale of finance is so huge and currently really equitable approaches to financing are the exception rather than the rule. And at that point, that is going to create a challenge for a just energy transition. There are, there are countries that have made what we might call alternative financing models the norm, and that's something that we can really aspire to. So the first thing I want to say is I think alternative financing has two particular advantages. The first advantage is that it simply unlocks new streams of finance that can be used for clean energy that might not previously have been channeled to that beforehand. So for example, individual households that might have had uh, the personal environmental motivations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions could not invent, invest in a large scale nuclear plant or hydro plant, but they can put a solar panel on their roof. So this opens up new opportunities for investment and, and consequently no, more funding. But I think the second and more important argument is that a lot of alternative financing models build social capital and build people's personal sense of ownership over the climate agenda. And that's a really important way to build a broader cross society momentum behind clean infrastructure and, and sustainable infrastructure more broadly. And so um, someone has mentioned more generally things like community based financing and, um, and urban poor funds and those kind of initiatives really change the way the people's expectations of their infrastructure um, and their their sense of their of what that infrastructure should be delivering for them. And that's a really important shift. And so the example I want to give there is of Germany where um, Germany is really at the forefront of the clean energy transition, which is not to say that everything it's doing is perfect, but it's really done a huge amount to advance wind and solar. And it's done that largely by empowering individuals, communities and municipalities to invest very heavily in clean energy. So of Germany's renewable energy generation capacity today, I think 6% is owned by municipal authorities and 47% is owned by citizen co-ops. So by creating this overarching framework, something that in a British context or other places might be considered a relatively alternative financing model has become mainstream. And it's meant that Germany retains, even during times of, for example, financial crisis, this deep sense of support for the clean energy transition and for cleaner energy infrastructure. Um, so in that way, the role of alternative financing models goes well beyond just the value of the funds that they put in. 
Uh, yeah, I, th thanks for that. Uh, I think our final question that we'll take in this session before we transition into uh, thinking more about universities is uh, there was a question there um, coming from James Paskins about what do we think the role of community groups is in, in these transitions and particularly in decentralised infrastructure. Um, and I'm going to maybe get uh, Sam to chip in there because it's, um, I know uh, alongside your work, uh, your job within the trade union movement that you've also been involved in local kind of energy transitions in your own local community in London. Um, so yeah, Sam, do you want to talk more about perhaps your experience and the potential um, that may as yet be untapped um, for grassroots local community groups to, to be part of this movement and perhaps what some of the new technologies um, are enabling in that area. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, a couple of things to say on this. First, I'm gonna say the very unpopular thing, which is very unpopular with um, environmental NGOs particularly, is that we don't largely support community-based energy programs. And that there's a, a reason for this, um, not because we're against community energy per se. And I'm saying this also on a personal level and things which I've been involved with around campaigning and energy poverty and more in a Pacific urbanized environment sitting here, for example, in Northeast London. Um, one, because we think that the large scale energy solutions have to be planned, they have to be national. Um, they are huge infrastructure projects. So whilst it's nice, you know, in, areas like Hackney in East London can do a solar project. It actually excludes a lot of people from energy and energy production. So it goes to this prosumer model. On the other side of it, I think those con conversations are really helpful because one thing I found in, in my work, both sort of professionally and the stuff I do as an activist, is we have a very low level of literacy, both around carbon and energy and what the energy system is. And I think it's you know interesting the discussion they've had in Camden and how this may have come up in some of the, um, the, the, the groups um, there and the discussions, because I, I think that's what's been so surprising. And then I think anybody who kind of works around this space for a long period of time then starts to see where community energy, for example, doesn't really fit well into the overall picture um, uh, because once you're sort of literacy and understanding around energy systems and how they operate and how they work and some of the technicalities in it but on the other hand I think as well um, that there is I, I think it's important to engage and understand that as well because for example things like waste for energy now this is a very live dispute going on in my area at the moment that's going to cover seven local authorities um, you know, so burning waste to produce energy for social housing projects, which is called a low carbon project. And, and actually, there's a lot of community kickback about that. But again, very little understanding about what district heating means and some of the implications around that. So I think community groups can have a really positive role to play, and they, they certainly should have. But I probably would see it more in starting to understand some of the um, not building knowledge around energy and what energy transitions mean in, in reality and for us as communities as, and, and as workers and as users, consumers of energy. Okay, Sam, that's an interesting uh, perspective. We were talking about the, the roles of different actors and their perceptions of, of uh, what a just transition might be, in particular with regards to energy. There's an interesting perspective um, that we haven't covered so much yet, which uh, you've been working uh, with and on pretty, is around uh, private uh, developers, private actors in the energy field, but not the usual suspects, not the usual big, uh, big guns, but actually those who are working around um, off-grid energy system, which actually are relevant for many more people across the world. Could you tell us a little bit more what their perspectives are and um, what you've learned from working with them? Sure, thank you, Barbara. Uh, just to kind of set the scene, and I'm sure we know this, but uh, globally nearly a billion people do not have access to electricity and nearly three billion people do not have access to clean cooking fuels. And uh, we find that uh, the problem is concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa. And what we are also finding and acknowledging that some of the traditional grid systems are simply not working. And this is where the private sector has really come into kind of strength and pay, whether it's true 
individual systems such as solar home systems, microgrids, mini grids. So coming up with a range of uh, decentralized solutions. And I'm currently working on a fellowship funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering in partnership with the private sector. And what we are finding there is uh, through solar home systems, for example, uh, what the private sector is doing is enabling energy access to households who are at the base of pyramid who consume small amounts of energy. So this is quite significant because they're catering to this market where you have a large number of consumers who consume small amount of energy. And the real tricky balance here is finding this balance between affordability for those households and how those businesses can sustain in an enabling environment. But sadly, what we are finding this year is that the pandemic, COVID-19, is throwing it at a challenge as we find that disposable incomes for those households are further reducing. So this means that access to electricity is no longer affordable for them. And our worry is a lot more houses are going to fall into this energy poverty trap, which is going to now hinder progress to SDGs. So there's going to be this kind of debate discussion around partnerships, public-private partnerships, subsidies, innovative business models, which can ensure delivery of electricity to those households um, in a way which is affordable and sustainable through the pandemic and beyond. So I want to conclude by saying that for equity and justice, for me, are kind of the key challenges which face us um, during COVID, post-COVID, as we move forward to a just future. Yes, thanks very much for thanks very much for this point, uh, Priti. And and clearly, the the COVID pandemic has shone the line on inequalities and the ways in which uh, inequalities uh, along various uh, social identities of class, gender, ethnicity, etc., are very much visible um, in many and and. and felt very differently across, across various groups. Um, I wanted to bring attention um, uh, to the ways in which many communities are responding also to the energy crises. Um, and I wanted to ask Sarah, who's done some work on that. Uh, and you, Sarah, do you mind answering this? Thank you. Sure. Sorry, the inevitabilities of doing Zoom calls at home where the doorbell goes, but I'm going to count on somebody else getting it. Um, thanks for the question, Barbara. And it was really interesting to hear your perspectives on that, Sam, because I was um, quite surprised to hear that as the perspective coming out of the trade union movement. Um, I, I, I guess I think that uh, my perception of this would be that a strong trade union movement is often grounded in a strong community a strong sense of community and a partnership to an extent between unions and businesses and seeing that healthy businesses are grounded in um, uh, a, a respect for labor and, and so on and, and a shared vision for the future. And that's quite a, a big picture statement, obviously, because I was a little bit thrown on the spot by this question. Um, but I, I guess that the, the reason for saying that is I think that a vision for the trade union movement of empowering its workers and therefore households to have greater energy literacy and to be part of the production side of things as much of the consumption side of things should be should be an aspiration to kind of rebalance that relationship. But I, I think it's a big issue and one that is, um, is hard to really dive into the weeds of without certainly a bit more thought at my end. Mm -hmm. the, the main point I guess I'd want to raise is that a lot of the countries that have really been at the forefront of community energy are countries that also have that balance to a greater extent between labor and capital uh, and where you know workers sit on boards and so on and have oversight. And I think that those things are linked because there's a narrative there about, um, about power relations that is a bit different from where we're sitting today in, in the UK. Uh, sorry for the fumbling nature of that answer. It's a huge question. <laughs> It, it, it is a huge question, um, and sorry if I put you on the spot for that. I mean, I think this it is a really important question, and many of you have brought to the fore this issue of power, this issue of trying to develop a form of conversation where very different opinions might be able to talk in a way that actually can move things forward. Um, and maybe this is the occasion for us to shift a little bit the focus of this conversations toward what can be the role of universities 
in supporting and fostering these kinds of dialogue, the kind of evidence that is necessary for these kinds of conversations to be able to, to move forward in a uh, substantive and evidenced way. So I also know from having spoken to all of you that you've all had experience of course, of working well, either from the university or on the other side of working with people in the university. And I'd really like us to try and uh, talk about these different experiences. And some of them are more or less uh, easy. So please don't hesitate to, to raise the difficult questions. We all need to get better at doing this kind of, of multi-stakeholder engagement and, and facilitating this kind of conversations. Um, perhaps, Sam, you'd like to kick us, uh, kick, sorry, not Sam, I was thinking of Adam, actually, because Adam has been working with UCL um, and, um, and has found it both interesting and I think at times also a little bit challenging. So please, um, Adam, if you could tell us a little bit about the, the issues that you've encountered. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I've got kind of two main points to, work about, to talk about. One is um, the really fantastic work we've done uh, over recent years and the second is about um, a particular project in the Bloomsbury area actually which uh, you know you asked for something challenging so I will put it out there and hope, hope it doesn't cause too much trouble for people um, but yes uh, UCL were really helpful and very involved in uh, the Citizens Assembly both in helping to set it up to advise on it to uh, to advise on on the governance um, UCL sustainability's team uh, presented during, during the assembly to help uh, bring the citizens up to speed uh, and they did a fantastic job with that and then at, at the end of the whole session, the, uh, uh, another part of UCL evaluated uh, the project in terms of public engagement and, and the success of the whole process. And that's, that's a report that's available online. It's worth a read if, if others are interested in citizens' assemblies and how to make them work. It's a, it's a warts and all report. Um, if you want to see some of the things that didn't go quite so well as well, um, I do recommend it. Um, I should just say as well, uh, more broadly with uh, UCL as, uh, as the, you know, one of the biggest universities, probably the biggest in the borough, um, UCL do a lot. Uh, the council does a lot. We have a huge range of responsibilities uh, and uh, the, the council and, and UCL do speak to each other on a number of levels, but we, um, we put ourselves through a, a peer review earlier this year. And one of the, the main findings was we, that Camden isn't maximizing its institutional relationships as, as, as well as it, it could be doing so, partly because we have so many, we were very, very lucky in, in that sense. But I think, uh, I, I think we, could, we could all work on greater coordination so that the public sector in Camden, the people of Camden can benefit more from UCL's uh, expertise uh, and vice versa. The project I was going to uh, mention, this is the provocative one, is that there is a long-standing uh, energy network in Bloomsbury called the Bloomsbury Heat and Power Network, which UCL is uh, one part of, as well as other universities in the area, and it needs upgrading rapidly. And I don't quite know what the future of that is. Um, the university's finances have created because of COVID. I don't know, things are very difficult at the moment, but um, to really be transitioning to you know, a zero carbon borough, we would really be hoping that that uh, network, when it's upgraded in the next few years, is zero carbon or as low carbon as possible. So. Um, Decisions around that are still pending, I believe. So. Pretty. Could you give us your sense of how how universities um, can best be helpful in fostering these conversations that we desperately need around energy transitions? Yes, thank you. And Adam, it was great to hear about kind of your partnership with UCL. Um, and I would say that what universities can do is they can bring together, they can convene interdisciplinary expertise very readily and easily. Uh, and th those panels, those teams uh, can then develop the evidence base, which is required both to understand the wide ranging benefits of energy access, but also to then very carefully consider trade-offs. So for example, earlier I mentioned that there's this sort of trade-off when we think about from public-private partnerships, when we think about private sector involvement in energy access, uh, reach those households at the last mile. And when we think about affordability of those households, I mean, the private sector also has kind of tensions around creating business models to sustain themselves. And this is an area which needs very careful work. This is an area where we need kind of more nuanced understanding of household needs and aspirations and trends, because somehow there's this sense that in a country household needs are uniform, but they are not uniform. We've worked with households where uh, some households are quite content with using a mobile phone charger and three light bulbs. 
or six other households who need more energy access at this point. Now we recognize that energy kind of access is dynamic, so the aspirations will shift in the future uh, with a likely increase in consumption. But there's this real kind of conflict of tension here between um, making sure we meet those households' needs in a way which is affordable and just, but also providing this enabling environment for the private sector. And I believe that academia can really kind of foster those partnerships by thinking hard about affordable, sustainable, innovative business models and partnerships. Thank you very much. Sarah? You wanted to add something on this issue. Thanks very much. And it's another great question. I guess the first thing I wanted to add is that I really don't think this is a, a story solely of lessons from the North being applied to lessons from the South. Uh, I think, firstly, lessons from the North are not always applicable uh, in a lot of uh, low income or middle income countries. And I think, second, there are a huge number of emerging economies that have an awful lot to teach the North about energy transitions. Um, you can probably tell from my accent and Sarah's as well that we're Australian and we are right at the back of any energy transition and we have a lot to learn from places like China and South Africa and, and other countries about the processes of fossil fuel subsidy reform, the processes of constructing um, cleaner energy systems, the processes of bringing citizens, businesses and civil society along on that journey. Specifically for, for universities, and this piggybacks a bit on the points Pretty was making, I guess there's two main uh, evolutions that I'd be really excited to see from universities. Um, the first of these is much, many universities in the North need to strive for much more equitable and balanced partnerships with universities from the South when they design research. The fact that the funding comes from the North does not necessarily mean that the researchers in the North always have the most value to add. And there's too often this funding model whereby um, researchers in the global South are contracted to do some number crunching and some field work, but don't get to be a part of the process of iteration and learning and conceptualization around what that means. And that means that the really important lessons from those um, that, that research that they've conducted are often tucked away behind paywalls and they, they should be very much a part of the co-creation throughout the whole project. And the second thing is that the pandemic for all its many sins and tragedies might have created a new norm in terms of virtual learning and our capacity to put on online some of the world's best teaching um, around energy transitions and to create more equitable spaces for people to access that. Um, I, I think it would personally be absolutely extraordinary for students in Kampala or Buenos Aires or Jakarta to be able to benefit from the teaching um, and, and support that's available at world-class universities like UCL. Um, that, has a, that has been something that's experimented with in the past with things like MOOCs, but now it's becoming the new normal and, and a real depth of academic staff and, and those around them now have the capacity to, to do that online at, at scale. And I think that there's an opportunity to democratize, um, democratize education globally. Thanks for uh, yeah. provocations. Yeah, sorry, Sarah. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Sarah and Barbara. I think I'm also just um, keeping track of the questions coming from the floor. And there's a question still sitting at the top there about, um, you know, it's essentially about this um, tension between, you know, the need for a complete revolution, um, complete restructuring of the energy system and power relations and so forth versus a more pragmatic kind of response of just dealing with the um, energy system as we've got it and the powerful actors that are already, you know, the incumbents in that system. Um, and I'm curious about what might be the role in the university, the role of the university in helping us to get to those kinds of questions. So, so on the one hand, we could each just give our answers there, but Preeti talked about the university being a place of convening interdisciplinary expertise and potentially also we might think of it as con convening different kind of actors around the table. Um, but Sam, what do you, what's your experience or what do you think about how well universities are doing um, at getting to some of the answers to these questions um, rather than, you know, yeah, I guess that, that's the question. How, how well are we helping uh, different um, actors, different sectors in our society to be able to come to answer some of these really deep questions? Um, or to what extent are we just, you know, re, um, re-inscribing the status quo perhaps? 
Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's a big and important question. And I, just to step a little bit back to my earlier contribution around community energy, and I'm not going to go back into that and certainly get to your question. I, I think, and I've noticed with some of the contributions, because we're coming from a position of public partner or what we call public worker partnerships, not the private sector. So, and I, and I think, so when it comes actually to this question around the current economic models and what universities are doing. So there's, there's two sides to that sort of on, on one level, universities are serving the kind of fossil fuel interests. We saw this particularly around the fracking debates in the UK where there were Pacific, I mean, around Strathclyde University backing up all the arguments on fracking. Um, so where we, we, we had a, a really big issue around the, the big support for that, that model and the um, particularly fracking companies. Um, we see something similar emerging around blue hydrogen, so that's hydrogen from natural gas, which is being pushed in, in Leeds, for example, where there's a project there, and obviously Imperial College has, has a huge part of this around the Sustainable Gas um, Institute there. So in a way, and, you know, and there are reasons for that, obviously, for universities to engage in that or not. On the other side, um, you know, if I take somewhere like Leeds, we've been working with academics there. When I say we, actually, it's the, the Leeds um, Trade Union Council there. So they've been working on the flip side with academics and experts around, well, actually, how can we push back around this um, hydrogen gas program that they want to roll out in um, Leeds and look at different ways and working with people with expertise, for example, around retrofitting and construction um, and changing the nature of that. So I, I think, you know, it, 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 I, I guess it depends where the universities are coming from or where those um, activists, um, academics are perhaps coming from. I mean, we've had Obviously, we, we do a lot of work with academics and universities around different spheres of our, our work. Um, but I suppose, like anything, we can always find people that will kind of reinforce the positions that we want to put forward. Um, and I've certainly sat in conferences where you, you've had a panel, um, I could think of one in Scotland around energy transition, where we, we certainly had academics from Edinburgh University actually talking about the first place we have to start is in conservation and retrofit, which we entirely agree with. But then other academics who are obviously supporting the trade unions there around the um, offshore oil and gas um, and saying we, we can't stop doing this tomorrow and we've got to carry on doing it. So I think that's the difficulty of it. Um, but I mean, obviously, for us, it's something that, you know, it's an expertise we will always look to and want to engage with and, and, and bring in the, the wider global debates. And I just say the, um, interestingly, the Energy Democracy Initiative I mentioned earlier, um, that actually comes out of the New York Public in University um, of, of Academics, who actually started all of that. So I think, you know, we have some healthy mixes, um, but... I, I guess it's your your starting points. And I, I just go back as well from more sort of local and parochial level on a community basis. And I think, you know, relating to stuff done around, done around new Lucas plan, um, which were former Lucas Aerospace workers um, who came from an alternative corporate plan back in the 1970s. I mean, they actually tried to work very closely with universities developing their ideas for um, what tragically were prototypes for wind turbines and things that we'd very much want to be producing today and couldn't even then get support of universities to do that, although the open, some from the Open University did come in. But I think, you know, that's certainly at a community level and a worker level where it would be fantastic where we've got these ideas and can work together to start developing some of these in a very practical way around some of the, the technical ways because workers have knowledge um, not, not necessarily codified knowledge or institutionalized knowledge in that way, but they know very much about their, their sectors and, you know, and, and that and those kind of tacit knowledge and experiences should be combined, obviously, with the academic arena. Thanks very much, Sam, for really, uh, really interesting thoughts here. And of course, indeed, the, the, the idea that there's lots of different knowledges out there. And the question I have, actually, is what is what can be the role of the university in, is it a role of mediation? Is it a role of translation between these various kinds of knowledge that exist out there? Is it a role of valorization of certain knowledges that don't usually get heard so much? 
Um, I think that's a really important question that, that some of you have been raising already in different ways. Another question that comes from, I think from, from Sam's uh, point here is, you know, what is it that, I mean, the fact that we actually can't ignore the political economy of universities, where are they located? Whose voice do they like to support? Um, and whose voice do they feel more that they can support? And that's an internal question within the university, which we need to sort of think a little bit about. And so on the first point, I'd like to hear specifically um, from uh, Adam in the context of the Citizen Assembly. And on the latter point, I'd like to hear more from Sarah, who works across the university and different um, uh, groups and therefore might have a, a, a bit of a distance in the way in which you can apprehend the role of the university and how it positions itself as a mediator across various actors. Can, can we have Adam first please? Thanks very much. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier on was that UCL was involved in advising on the governance of the Citizens Assembly which was important uh, because the uh, Citizens Assembly uh, initiative I think was very broadly welcomed but there were there was challenge uh, from some quarters about how it was run you know understandable challenge very fair challenge so how it was run and how it was governed and having UCL involved in that um, helped um, you know I think reassure people that, um, that, that the governance issues were being taken seriously um, but UCL were not the only members of the, the governance panel we also had uh, a climate emergency community group in Camden who were who were part of it as well as a local uh, engineering firm. So there's quite a variety of different perspectives who are who input into that and that helped I think make it a, a really uh, robust process. Um, I was actually just going to uh, mention as well Sarah, Sarah's work about uh, Sarah's work in Camden. So I'll let her speak speak to that. But I think um, if, if I may say it um, represents one of the many many different kind of touch points that exist between. A local authority in the university and local communities in the university sometimes which can be a bit uh, difficult to get to get a handle on because there are, there are so many um, and um, we can you know again think about my earlier points about how we you know, maximize uh, the relationships uh, I, I would only just uh, add one other point as well which is it's not about the citizens assembly but we've done a huge amount of work in Camden in recent years on air quality and aiming to get to World Health Organization standards for air quality, which are too few people in, in the country really uh, acknowledge and the government is still rest, resisting that in the current environment bill. And it's not it's not UCL, but we work very closely with King's College London, who are leaders in air quality. And again, that they they essentially helped us map a route to WHO air quality standards by 2030 by examining the actions we propose to take uh, in, a, in a different uh, kind of uh, participatory forum, which we experimented with before the assembly. Um, and again, having Kings uh, 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 um, examine that and, and show that these ambitious political um, goals are achieved. We seem to have a... Again, this helps us import their quality goals. Thanks, Adam. Sarah, I wanted to grab your, your thoughts on, on this issue of, of role of the university, what role universities can play. Is that Sarah Bell? You've got the two Australian Sarahs. Sarah, which... Brenda, it's complicated yes. to have two yeah, Sarahs, yeah, yeah. the two Australian Sarahs. <laughs> right, we're both waiting on each other. A very courteous behaviour, very un-Australian. <laughs> I'm going to be even more discourteous, Barbara. I apologise. And I'm going to take your question with response to the question from Philippe Garcia, which seems to have a lot of appetite about the pros and cons of implementing a carbon tax. We're going to come back to that. But ah. you... You won't be let off the hook, but if you prefer to do that first, up to you, but I won't let you off the hook. Well, I thought I, I actually thought it was a very similar answer mm. is, is the reason I wanted to bring it together. But in that case, I'll try to answer your, your original question more, more specifically, uh, which is to say that um, uh, I think that the university's role of, of convening in this space needs to be understood more broadly. I, I hugely agree with a, a couple of people made the points earlier about the value of an interdisciplinary approach and bringing together different perspectives to come up with a much richer understanding of the, the policy options that are available to respond to this challenge, um, messages that resonate with different audiences and the political economies of, of landing this and so on. But I think universities as, as largely as very trusted public actors 
have a really important role to play in convening beyond the academic silos and bringing organizations into the room, such as the trade unions, such as the community groups, such as local councils to facilitate a conversation that's grounded in science and informed by evidence to make sure that that is really reaching out to a much wider audience. And that's, um, and that is hopefully not dissimilar to what Sarah Bell would have said if the other Sarah had fielded this question, but let's find out. <laughs> I think it means you. Um, yeah, so so I'm sort of uh, flipping my uh, roles here. Um, yeah, so I think I, I think I would kind of share Sam's kind of perspective um, in that I think we are um, there's a broader need for us to widen the kinds of constituencies that we collaborate with and. Um, and serve in our kind of, you know, uh, producing and sharing knowledge, which is our basic purpose. And, you know, as we're all very aware in the current kind of global climate, you know, producing and sh creating and sharing knowledge is not as simple and straightforward as we once might have hoped uh, it, it was, um, but in fact may never have been. Um, and I think it is telling that universities have, um, worked quite closely uh, historically and, and currently even um, with um, fossil fuel companies uh, and other very powerful actors and interests, you know, in the, in the finance sector and others who um, to uh, perpetuate this, you know, system that is uh, not, uh, what, you know, that is contributing to the climate emergency. So in my own work, um, through the engineering exchange, through collaborations with a London-based network called Just Space. Um, we've been really looking at deep questions about how do universities actually collaborate with grassroots community groups? How, you know, it's very, um, I, I think, uh, speaking as an engineer, I find it quite shocking. And I've been um, in and around universities for 20 or more years. Um, we often have heads of industry on our panels. Sam, I think, is the first or the only trade union member that I've ever been on a panel with. Um, and so, so we very um, happily engage with senior executives, certainly in the resource industry, fossil fuel industry, major engineering services industries. Um, my own view is we should not necessarily stop doing that. I'm more of a kind of, you know, academic freedom, broad church, way of thinking about universities. But if we are engaging with those people, then we should also be bringing workers, environmentalists, grassroots community groups, I think, much more strongly um, into, our, uh, into our partnerships and, and into our um, collaborations. Mm. Um, so I think now might be the time do we need to hear about Sarah's views on the carbon tax. Do we get to that? This could be a very dull 20 minutes where the two Australians just <laughs> bounce questions backwards and forwards. Um, so, so I have I, no views on carbon tax, by the way, so that, that's the end for me. Uh, okay, I'll bounce back to you after this, Barbara, then, uh, courteously. Um, thanks for the question, Philippe. I think it's really... Um, a very pertinent challenge at the time because COVID has caused this unprecedented fiscal crisis and governments are going to be looking for new instruments that can raise, raise money for them, raise revenue for them in an equitable and sustainable way, particularly with a wave of very welcome climate commitments coming down the line. But we've also seen in places like France with the Yellow Vest protests or in places like Australia that briefly had the highest carbon price in the world before it was repealed, that um, you really do need this depth of support to, to come forward for, to, to sustain a carbon tax and to, to manage the trade-offs that do come with that policy. So I guess um, I, I'm going... My position then would be broadly that a carbon tax is the right policy instrument, but it would need to be introduced in a way that really makes sure that the costs of that tax are borne very clearly by, by those who can afford it and that the, the revenues that are raised are redistributed in a, in a popular way for public, agendas like public health or education that, that make sure it has a depth of support. 
And I think universities have a real role to play in that. And I speak particularly to the economics dis discipline at the moment, which has done so much work on carbon taxes. And so much of it is completely inaccessible, even to people like myself who also studied economics. Um, the, the need for this much more clear, simple messaging around why a carbon tax can be progressive and what else needs to be done to make it much more fair uh, and, and how the, the revenues from that carbon tax can be distributed in ways that support uh, business, support a range of clean, clean businesses, including clean energy to thrive, that support citizens to have a better quality of life, that tackle um, correlated problems such as air, air pollution. Is, is a really important role for academics to play in the public debate and in making it clear that this is not a debate that's narrowly confined to a few intellectual elites in the corner, but something that has the potential to generate really positive broad-based benefits and, and give people that, that um, literacy in the language of this and this real sense of buy-in into, into this, what is otherwise quite a contentious and problematic tool. Thanks, Sarah. That's a really helpful response. And I think I, some of the questions uh, I was pushing to, to the panel regarding the role of the university is very much related to that discussion, to this issue of how does one create a public discussion? And so what kind of language must one use? Much, what kind of evidence uh, needs to be developed? Um, and also, but we need to go beyond that. We need to think of, of the nuts and bolts, right? How do we actually work with very different kinds of actors? And I think we mustn't be blind to the fact that universities have had an expertise of working with certain actors, but much less so with others. And so how do we, if we really believe in the public role of the university, how do we trans transcend these borders? How do we expand the, the groups of people that the university talks to, to really become not just interdisciplinary, but transdisciplinary in the way in which it moves forward. So thanks for all of your inputs on that. We, there's a really interesting question um, that comes from the audience and that links to uh, the question, the, your introduction here talking about uh, carbon tax, uh, Sarah, and that's a question regarding uh, COVID-19 and how COVID-19 is affecting progress towards the energy transition. Um, I think I'm going to send the, 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 the panel, the question to um, Priti, please. Sure. Um, I, was, I think I was highlighting earlier that COVID-19 is slowing down progress towards the energy transition, because what is happening is that we have communities, populations who are in lockdown, who on one hand need access to electricity to gain access to public health campaigns, to gain access to information, which is so crucial and relevant for them. Uh, but due to loss of livelihood, they are unable to afford access to electricity solutions, whether they're from public sector, whether they're from private sector. And there's a real risk here that we may lose those households in this process of transition to clean energy or just transition. So I think my thinking here is that moving forward, we will need to think creatively about business models we can employ, about subsidies that can be offered in a way which is meaningful to those households so that they have continued access to electricity. Because if they lose access to electricity, it limits kind of productive use of electricity for livelihood for small and medium enterprises. So I think we have to be very careful to kind of see how COVID-19 affects progress and think about the future, think about those households who may be at risk of energy poverty, whether they're in Sub-Saharan Africa, whether they are globally or in UK, as a matter of fact, because I know that this is an issue with households in UK as well. Thanks very much, Priti. So lots of really interesting food for thought here. Um, anybody else on the panel wants to respond to uh, how COVID-19 is likely to influence this transition, this energy transition from your perspective? Yes, Sarah, Colin, Brenda. Thanks, Barbara. I guess I just wanted to actually add in some numbers, if that's all right, just because there's been a, a, a ODI has been involved in something called the Energy Policy Tracker recently, which has been looking at the way that governments have chosen to spend their fiscal stimulus packages with respect to energy uh, since the pandemic broke out. And the numbers that I have on that show the extent to which COVID is affecting progress either faster or slower um, in different countries towards the energy transition. So, so since the pandemic broke out, uh, G20 countries have spent 52% of all their new energy spending on fossil fuels, occasionally with conditions, but mostly unconditional support for fossil fuels. So that amounts to 233 billion US dollars. 
Um, 35% of the fiscal stimulus package has gone to clean energy and the remainders to things that are more contested, like large hydrogen projects and nuclear, which are, are clean by some metrics and environmentally unsustainable by others. But I think the really interesting point that comes out of those numbers is that we can't necessarily take a global perspective on, on the trends that COVID is causing in the energy transition. Different countries have really different allocations of their investment. France, Germany and China have all invested most of their funding in clean energy where they are spending their fiscal stimulus packages on the energy sector. The UK and the US have mostly put their money into fossil fuels, which is particularly striking with the UK hosting the climate talks this year, next year in Glasgow. Um, so you're seeing this divergence. Countries that were doing well are doing even better. Uh, countries that were doing, doing badly are, are using this as an opportunity to really lock in to a high carbon path, which is uh, very, uh, very alarming in light of the urgency of, of cutting emissions. Yeah, very good point and actually quite uh, distressing in many ways. Thanks for that, uh, Sarah. Um, Sam, I think you wanted to add something on the COVID-19, uh, the, the impact of COVID-19 on just Yeah, ju just quickly and, it, and hopefully follows on a little bit from what Sarah said. I mean, I, I think it's quite interesting. And again, it goes back to this question of why we call the public ownership of energy and the energy transition. Um, even before COVID hit, I mean, certainly in Europe, Financing for energy transition was falling, private sector investment. This has been happening for quite a long while. So we often quite want to talk up about the transition to renewable energy and more coming on stream. But actually, when you look at it and you look at the International Energy Agency forecasts, is we're not really getting anywhere near this. So clearly, COVID is going to impact that. But I think what we've also seen from a, a jobs perspective in some of those discussions, I mean, is really driving down on workers and workers out of the, the, the sector and bringing in practices, which you've seen across the whole of the economy, but lots of more automization, digitalization processes as well, which are actually displacing people from the energy sector. And in fact, it's always been one of our arguments around the fossil fuel and jobs issue is that jobs are rapidly being lost in the fossil fuel sector in any case. Um, regardless of the, the energy transition. So we see a lot of this happening on the, the back of the COVID crisis, which is largely going unnoticed or untalked about. But so we're, we're kind of seeing what we are calling a kind of just transition happening, but of course isn't just um, because the, the things that we'd normally want in place around negotiation, social protections are, are not there. There's not the, a facility to actually engage with that at the moment. Thanks very much, uh, Sam. I mean, this raises a really important question regarding the scales of intervention, isn't it? And, and before uh, we go back to some of the questions from the floor, I just wanted to ask um, from Adam, um, how are you managing in the conversation you, or did, was it an issue that came up in the Citizens' Assembly to discuss the kind of scales of intervention, um, who is involved, who can do what? I mean, I'm thinking, for instance, reskilling of those workers in the fossil fuel industry, who should be uh, driving this kind of reskilling process. So in discussing, in discussing, for instance, what might be a just uh, or, or a response to the climate crisis at a local level, were you able to engage with the multiple scalar uh, kinds of action that need to be taken? Um, I imagine that would be an important part of the conversation to build a, uh, a collective response. Uh, I think the short answer is no, but if I can elaborate, hopefully it will still be an interesting answer. Um, we were keen to pack as much into the three session assembly as, as we could. There was an awful lot the citizens to absorb and, and to take on uh, as part of planning that and also to you know to try and retain people and not have people drop out as, as i mentioned can, can happen as part of that we did uh, we, we focused on uh, the locality and uh, the council and uh, and, and some uh, various education but we, we deliberately left out um, national and international policy uh, partly as a management issue, issue. Um, but as part of the process, I think the citizens would have liked more opportunity to, to discuss that and understand how, how, how that fits in and start to make some recommendations. So you could 
uh, we do the, the assembly, we, we may well have done it differently had we known that at the start uh, uh, as we did at the end, but, but perhaps we wouldn't do that because we also wanted to, it to be focused and uh, we, you know, we, we had various worries about, about, about that. Um, so uh, I think that's essentially where we got to, but I, I would just add as well, um, coming out of the assembly, we have appointed an ongoing citizens panel of 15 citizens who are, I think only one is an original assembly member, the others have come in and they're going to be advising, working with us over the next two years on, on our community action. Uh, so scrutinizing the council, as well as uh, translating it into something, helping us translate uh, our work into something meaningful for the community. So there is still an ongoing process, uh, which may be an opportunity to explore some of those issues. Mm, that sounds great. Thanks very much uh, for this input. I think there's more questions coming from the floor in these last 10 minutes that we have open to us, um, Sarah? Yeah, I think there was, um, there was a question about how, um, how do we influence um, ministries of education or schools authorities really to get to, um, to have better uh, content or approaches in the curriculum at, um, in schools. So, so we're at the university level of education, but I think, um, you know, so, so there might be two ways of thinking about this. What is, how do we get um, better education into our schools and colleges system um, around issues of uh, environment, SDGs, climate change, and so on. So the example that was given was fracking, but there are many others. Um, but the alternative way of thinking about, or another way of building on that question is what's the role of universities? You know, we are part of the university sector. Often we just think of ourselves as kind of sucking up um, a certain number of students that float out of the school system. Um, but how do we actually work with the education system more broadly to make sure that these issues are being dealt with in their full complexity at the appropriate kind of level of learning. Um, so I might just go to Adam uh, there as, <laughs> I don't know if you have any kind of conversations around this um, with your schools in Camden about uh, curriculum reform. Um, and if you see, you know, again, also, you, you, um, if you have any kind of, you know, word coming back on the street about how well UCL is um, is doing in relation to our kind of, even just our local kind of networks of schools um, and helping them to, to address these really complex issues uh, with their students. Thanks, Sarah. I mean, UCL has the UCL Academy in Canada, which um, I'm afraid I wish I knew a bit more about to give a better answer. I would hope um, UCL are, uh, you know, do advise on that curriculum and hopefully putting lots of uh, green, green issues in. Uh, we fortunately have a strong network of community schools uh, in Camden uh, and in the last year or so have set up what I think has been a really successful um, school student-led group called the Sustainers. So it's actually been very, very grassroots. There's huge demand from, from them to be more involved and, and we were very happy to respond. So we've been helping organise those. We, we had planned a school summit in March, which obviously got cancelled, um, which was now rescheduled for next year. And, and they're advising on a whole range of work from uh, activities within their own schools uh, to, to think about uh, changing the curriculum. So, so that work is in train. I'd, um, I've been a bit despondent when I saw the question come up actually, because I've seen this news recently in the UK about the government trying to ban even teaching about uh, things like communism, which I studied at school. And I think it's important to, to know about all sorts of things and um, to ban, supposedly banning discussion of white privilege as well. So I was pretty despondent, actually, because the, the, the Department for Education here does actually have quite extraordinary power to issue ordinances and prevent things being done. But um, on some issues in relations with the government, whether it's on, uh, on air pollution or carbon, you know, there can be quite a productive relationship. And I think there is a certain openness on that agenda. So I th certainly think it's worth pressing uh, the government here um, to, to allow discussion, to, pro to promote discussions of these issues. Thanks very much. Uh, On that point, I just wanted to mention that uh, the, grand the UCL Grand Challenges 
uh, do inform the UCL academic curriculum. So there is a space for definitely for UCL to hopefully uh, uh, bring up this issue to the fore. So the issue of climate change and energy transitions in particular, and the role of infrastructure in that. So, so thanks for, for bringing this up. Um, are there any other colleagues here on the panel who'd like to give a, an, an idea of how, how the, or have an, an experience of how the school curriculum could be um, injected with, with various voices on, on just transitions? Otherwise we'll move to... I think that was Pretty had an answer there. Thank you, Pretty. I think I'm going to also link it back to the role of universities so and share some of the lessons that I learned on my journey um, on the SDG work. So uh, we were um, commissioned additionally to apply the structured approach to review evidence for the sanitation sector. And when we presented this work to external stakeholders, a lot of uh, stakeholders came back to us and said, this is fantastic. You've reviewed over 600 publications as an interdisciplinary team, something we would have not done by ourselves. But uh, the way you're presenting the evidence is not accessible to us. It's not clear to us. The language that you use needs to be simplified. And then they further commissioned us to develop a very short policy brief for uh, influencing ministers in Sub-Saharan Africa. But the key point here, I think, is uh, as academics, I think we can be better at communicating science uh, to the public in a way which is more accessible. And I think this is a skill set that we need to then blend um, into curriculum, whether it's in universities um, or in schools, because if we get better at communicating science, it will be easier to then inform the curriculum at school level as well. That's a very good point. Thanks very much, Priti. Um, there's one more uh, question, uh, which comes from the floor uh, regarding, uh, Sarah, could you help me, Sarah Bell? Sorry, because I couldn't quite catch the one. You said there's another one from the floor that is particularly interesting or that has come up. Um, well, I, I think there were a couple, maybe just for Sarah, um, Colin Brand, we are doing the Australian Sarah thing. Okay, this one's over to you, um, Sarah. There are a couple of questions. Um, coming up that have been sitting there for a while around uh, green, around finance instruments. So two uh, in particular, I think there's one there about um, do these sustainable finance instruments actually work? And then also what is the role of this, um, you know, old fashioned patient public capital in infrastructure um, investment? And can we, are there ways to still uh, fund uh, infrastructure investment through government fiscal policy. Um, so those seem up your alley. Um, I don't know if Sarah... Oh, very happy is, to take a stab. Thanks, Sarah. Maybe Sam might want to come into that kind of, you know, given your um, emphasis on public ownership about, you know, the kind of economic realities of that. So, so I'll speak Sarah first and then Sam. Because that's what I do at the best of times, but also because I'm aware we'll want to move to final words soon. I guess with respect to the question about sustainable finance instruments, there's a, there is, as ever, a two-part answer. The first thing to say is that for the most part, green finance instruments are still, still need countries or cities or businesses to have the same capabilities they would have for traditional finance instruments. So the city of Cape Town cannot issue a green municipal bond unless the city of Cape Town can issue a municipal bond. And there's a whole range of preconditions in place for that. You know, the national government of South Africa would have to have, well, does have legislation in place that authorizes city governments to issue bonds. The city of Cape Town has to have a manageable debt ratio and a credit rating with an approved entity. It has to have clearly delineated projects that it can use that will um, generate a set of returns, or it has to have an independent revenue stream that will generate those returns. And then it has the option additionally of layering in environmental criteria so that it becomes green. So yes, green bonds absolutely have the capacity to, to play a major role, as do you know, land value capture or environmentally oriented public-private partnerships and the full suite of instruments out there. But they still require somebody to actually pay the, pay the money that anchors these investments, the funding for the finance, and they require a set of capabilities in the financial sector to do all of the standard finance things, as well as a new set of, set of skills to layer in robust environmental criteria. So, so they're not a solution, they're not a panacea. 
Um, with respect to the question about patient public capital, look, that the, the answer there is, is very similar in that uh, so Sub-Saharan Africa's fiscal challenges in the provision of infrastructure only become more complicated when you add in the climate imperative. It has been hard enough to finance energy infrastructure at scale in Sub-Saharan Africa, even when the costs were over the lifetime of the project through the ongoing purchase of, for example, coal or gas. It is that much harder when your entire capital investment is upfront in the construction of your solar or wind farm and you can't even distribute the costs over the lifetime of the project. So I guess the argument is that everything that we were doing in development, in the development sector broadly on fiscal policy, funding and finance still has to be done. But now it's harder with climate change. And I'm sorry, that's an unsatisfactory answer, but that's that's where it is. Thanks for that, Sarah. Uh, Sam, did you want to add something on, on this particular issue of finance? I think that's okay, as I can see, we're getting pretty near to time, so. Okay. <laughs> that's... Thank, thanks very much for, for everybody's thoughts. And uh, unsurprisingly, we covered a lot of very different wide ranging topics here. Um, uh, I was particularly happy that we could have such different entry points into this question. Um, different scales and different sets of actors who are not always uh, sufficiently around the table. It's clear that there's so many um, issues and trade-offs that are raised by the issue of energy transition. Um, and within that, there is a role for universities to facilitate these conversations and ensure that uh, more evidence base can be put on the table. But as many of our panelists around the table emphasize, um, that role needs to be thought quite carefully. Uh, the language that is used needs to be rethought. The kinds of actors that university engage with needs to be broadened um, and strengthened. Um, and, and there's therefore quite a lot for universities to do in order to facilitate what is inevitably a complex um, um, very complex issue at hand. So thanks again to all our panelists. Um, uh, thank you very much for coming to talk with us on what we all know are extremely busy days and very busy um, schedules. Thank you. We will continue the conversation uh, post-conference. Bye-bye.